There's a phrase or saying, I guess it's taken from the Bible, but I see it a lot around the holidays. It goes something like this, peace on earth and goodwill to all men. I've always liked that phrase, in the same way I always liked the idea of winning the lottery or a Sam Adams tall boy that never runs out of beer, no matter how much I drink. Awesome idea, but it's never going to happen. Now don't get me wrong, it sure is a nice thought, but having worked as a homicide detective for almost 15 years, I can tell you firsthand that crime doesn't take a break around Christmas. People will always be people, no matter what day of the year it is, and people cheat each other, rob each other, and kill each other, even on what's supposed to be the most peaceful day of the year. I think during my whole career in homicide I got called out to a scene on Christmas Day more than 50% of the time. I know the holiday is supposed to be about peace and, like I said, goodwill, but there's also something about that time of the year that brings out the very worst in people. I don't know if it's the alcohol, the cold, or the attempts to manufacture happiness, but for some folks, the cracks really begin to show around the holidays. Then, enough of those cracks and whole structures come crumbling down, sometimes with fatal consequences. That's what I figured happened with one case that I got back in the early 2000s. Me and my partner rolled up to this house on the North Shore. Nice place, four bedrooms, all decorated for the holidays. There was a woman lying in the driveway, with three entry wounds around her neck and shoulders. Walking past her, and we could see the front door was open. In the hallway, her husband was lying on his back with a single entry wound under his chin, and his brains splattered all over the ceiling and floor behind him. Scattered all over the carpeted floor of the home's front rooms, which were so exquisitely decorated they could have been the cover of a Christmas card, were dozens of sheets of printed paper. We began to carefully collect, photograph, and analyze them, but I think we were maybe only a third of the way through before we figured out what had happened. The pieces of paper depicted screenshots of text message chains, email threads, and other assorted evidence of marital infidelity. The wife was having an affair, the husband found out about it, and he presented all the evidence to her on Christmas morning, all wrapped up in a big red and white bow. I guess she tried to run, but the husband had his piece ready, meaning she barely made it halfway up the driveway before he shot her to death. Then, once he realized what he'd done, he put the gun to his own chin and pulled the trigger. It seemed like a pretty simple case, triggered by a cheating spouse, but... As we went through the motions of putting together our evidence file, we started to notice some frightening inconsistencies. First off, and this tends to be the case with most contemporary homicide investigations, we tried to locate the cell phones of the deceased and his victim. Unless a crime is entirely spontaneous, a perp's phone is usually a treasure trove of evidence, whether it's googling how to dispose of a dead body or overtly threatening their eventual victim via text messages, it's always worth checking a person's phone for a malice afterthought. For obvious reasons, we also needed to corroborate the printouts with what was actually on the wife's phone, but it soon became evident that neither the husband nor the wife's cell phone were anywhere to be found. We considered the possibility that the husband had disposed or hidden of the phones in order to prevent his wife from calling for help, but even after turning the whole house upside down, we couldn't locate either of them. That's when we turned to local cell carriers for helping in triangulating the phones, and if anyone's wondering, this is how that works. Basically, in your area, there will be any number of cell phone towers, and whenever your phone is switched on, your phone talks back and forth with whatever tower is closest in order to receive data. These cell phone towers store all the data from these little digital conversations, but your phone doesn't talk to just one at a time, It'll talk to a bunch of them. This means that law enforcement, or whoever wants to find you, can not only pinpoint your rough location, but can use triangulation to determine your location within an accuracy of a few hundred yards. Even if you turn your phone off prior to committing a crime, we can use your last known location, sometimes as a focal point for the coming investigation. And not only do these pings allow us to determine a phone's rough location, but we also know what time it was at any given place prior to being switched off. And this is where we discovered the second inconsistency. 
we estimated the time of the couple's death to be between 6.30 and 7 in the morning. We had a neighbor say that they heard what they thought were gunshots around that time, but figured it was simply someone test firing something Santa had brought them. The three to four shots they heard weren't followed by any screams or sirens or anything, so they just went back to sleep, adding that this was around 6.45 a.m. In which case, both husband and wife expired by 7 a.m. or 7.15 at the latest. But if that was the case, why was the final ping from both their cell phones recorded just prior to 8 a.m.? Or, to put it in layman's terms, how did two dead people both turn their phones off after their own deaths? As you can imagine, this blew our investigation wide open, since it meant that a third party had to have been present at the scene of the crime. This happened from time to time. Someone walks in on something they shouldn't have, then is too scared to talk about it for whatever reason. But placing our third party at the scene right around the same time the two phones stopped talking with the cell towers, that suggested something that was as chilling as it was unusual. Then after this tragedy, someone stepped over their dead bodies, turned off their phones, then absconded with them for reasons unknown. At that point, we were expecting more twists to the tale, but we didn't have to wait long for them. At first, when it came to ballistics analysis, everything seemed to check out. The gun found in the husband's hand was definitely the same one used to shoot his wife and then himself. There was also powder residue on the guy's chin, as well as on the gun's muzzle, meaning it had been fired point-blank at his chin. His fingerprints were on the trigger, as well as on the pistol's grip, but two things struck our ballistics experts as suspicious. The fingerprints on the grip were considerably fainter than those on the trigger, meaning there's no doubt that he pulled it, but if he did, it was with an unusually soft hold on the gun's grip. While it's not impossible to fire a gun like that, there's no way that he'd been able to shoot himself in that fashion without getting any gunshot residue over his shooting hand. And at that point, we officially had a homicide on our hands. It was a tiny, tiny slip-up, a detail that might have even gotten by a less professional investigation, but it didn't get by us, and like I said, it changed absolutely everything regarding our crime scene. In a way, choosing Christmas morning to commit a double murder displayed a twisted kind of genius. Commit the same murder in an urban apartment building even on Christmas Day, I'll find you half a dozen witnesses by the end of the day. But kill two people at 6.45 on Christmas morning in the suburbs and the best we had was a person who heard the shots. No one was awake to see or hear anything of real significance, and having left behind nothing in the way of forensic evidence, our killer was little more than a ghost. They even used the husband's own gun to really try and throw us off the scent, and although we were smart enough to figure out what we were looking at, we didn't have the luck required to be able to track our perpetrator. And don't get me wrong, we tried our absolute best to single out any suspicious vehicles entering or leaving the area, and we employed at least half a dozen other extensive investigative techniques to try and get an idea of who we were dealing with. But each time, we came back empty-handed, and the case eventually turned cold. Officially speaking, it's still an open investigation, and from what I've heard, it's been worked over by a couple of other detectives, each hoping to be the one to crack it. But just like ours... Their efforts proved fruitless, and each time, it's been tossed back in the rest of the cold cases, waiting for some other ambitious young greenhorn to come along and get lost in it all over again. Now, from experience, contract killers are something homicide detectives rarely encounter. People kill each other for all kinds of reasons, but very rarely do they kill complete strangers for vast sums of untraceable cash. Frankly, I found myself more disturbed by those who killed relatives or spouses to collect insurance money. I can almost understand being able to pull the trigger on a stranger, but my kid or my wife, not for all the money in the world. That being said, seeing evidence of something that verges on an urban legend, it was chilling, very chilling. It marked the one and only time I ever saw a sophisticated cover-up, one that worked just enough to have us looking in the wrong place for just long enough for a killer to get away scot-free. It makes me wonder just how many other cases are the same way. Someone goes missing, 
or passes suddenly while they're alone or at risk or potentially maybe taking their own life? How many cases are labeled a tragic accident when in reality, they're anything but... In my final year of primary school, which is fifth grade to all you Americans reading, we had this new kid join called Linford. I obviously can't talk for anyone else's school, but I imagine it's roughly the same all over. A new kid joins your school and is a bit standoffish and shy at first for obvious reasons, but after a few days of assimilating, they're either adopted by an individual or inducted into a pre-existing friend group. But that wasn't the case with Linford. Right away, kids began to say that Linford smelled. It was confirmed by anyone who sat next to him in class or in assembly or at dinner time. He didn't stink. It wasn't unbearable or anything like that. But I remember smelling him myself at one point and just feeling sorry for him. I was only 10, but I was old enough to know that if this kid smelled, there was definitely something wrong with his home life. I think a lot of kids probably felt the same way, but no one wanted to approach him for fear of being labeled the smelly kid's friend. Then finally, when someone did finally approach Linford, they soon regretted it. I remember there being a big fight one day on the school playground and all the kids ran over to watch. I was no different, but when I look at the two who were fighting, I saw that it wasn't so much a fight as it was a battering. Linford was smacking the smaller kid around the head while the kid tried desperately to shield himself. Teachers rushed over, wading through the sea of screaming kids to break this fight up, and Linford got suspended for the rest of the week while his victim only went home for the rest of the day. We had to wait a day to find out how the fight had started, but when we did, it was pretty shocking. Apparently all the kid did was walk over to Linford and ask if he wanted to come and play football with him and some friends. And that was it. Nothing was said in return. Linford just launched into the attack and started smacking the kid about. This was pretty terrifying to be honest. Even at that age, we kind of knew that Linford was a bit of a psycho if that's how he reacted to a friendly invitation. And when he returned to school at the start of the following week, everyone avoided him like the plague. That phase was even more depressing than the period after he first appeared. He'd obviously got a talking to from his parents and the head teacher, most likely encouraging him to make more of an effort to make friends. But by that stage, that ship had well and truly sailed. Everyone was terrified of him, so any attempts to ingratiate himself were almost instantly rebuffed. I remember kids saying things like, He's nice now, but how long until he snaps and lashes out again? And so that was that. Linford remained friendless, despite any attempt that he made to change that, and as time went on, those attempts got much, much more bizarre, and much darker. And it all culminated in Linford bringing a gerbil to school in an empty plastic rice pot. I'll never forget that. It was a pilau rice pot with all the different colored grains, but it was a pot that Linford had forgotten to equip with air holes. Obviously, the gerbil didn't survive the journey into school, but that didn't seem to bother Linford at all. He got caught playing with the poor thing's lifeless, suffocated body, and that was the end of Linford. I don't know where he went, if he went to some kind of behavioral school or something, but I most certainly didn't think that I'd ever see him again. So cut to the middle of year 11, which is 10th grade in American years, but the last compulsory year that we have to actually do in the UK. Seeing as it's the last year, we got to do exams, so obviously, year 11 is quite an important one. Then, in mid-October, I think it was, we had a new kid appear in our year group, presumably having moved from another school so he could do his exams at ours instead of wherever he was before. This is obviously a different school than the one I met Linford at, and although a lot of us ended up going to the same primary and secondary, it wasn't all the same people. That meant that when I had heard the news of the new kid, that was all I heard. I didn't realize who it was until I actually laid eyes on him. It was Linford, a 16-year-old version of the psycho that had played with a dead gerbil on his desk during a lunch break. And he'd grown up to be, as my little nephew says, an absolute unit. As you can imagine, 
News of who the new kid was swept through our school like wildfire, and just like it had all those years ago, rumors of what he was like had everyone either straight up avoiding him or walking on eggshells whenever he was around. He was scary back then, but now he was somewhere around 5 foot 10 and easily 15 stone to boot. I know I kept talking about how sad it all is, but I really do feel like the need to touch on it again. Linford had clearly never made any friends in the time that he'd been elsewhere, and while we'd all developed into charismatic young people, right on the cusp of adulthood, Linford seemed like the same weird loner he appeared to be in primary school. But then, just like the first time he joined our school, any sympathy people had for him quickly evaporated when he started acting like a total jerk to everyone. So in the last two years of secondary school, I was having this will-they-won't-they they kind of flirtation with a girl called Laura. We ended up getting together for a while after we left school, but while we were there, I think we were just too embarrassed to admit that we'd fancied each other, so we insisted that we were just friends while hanging out with each other almost non-stop. Anyway, one day, Laura comes up to me during lunch and tells me that she's got a bit of a problem. Linford had followed her home on the previous night, then stood outside her house until her dad went outside to shoo him away. I remember the sense of dread building as she talked because I could see what she was about to ask me from a mile away. She wanted me to approach Linford and tell him to stop following her home. Now I'll be honest, Linford did scare me, but that fear was somehow overridden by whatever nascent puppy love I was feeling for Laura so possibly against my best interests, I told her that I'd have a word with him. Then, at the end of the day, when it came time for Laura to walk herself home, I decided to walk with her. It was a bit of a detour from my own route home, but like I said, it seemed well worth it to prove what a good friend I was, aka boyfriend. We started on the walk, then what do you know? Linford suddenly appeared behind us, unmistakable with his jet black hair and telltale squint, Linford apparently needed glasses, but he never wore them. The moment I saw him, I stopped, told Laura to wait ahead of us, then walk back to confront Linford. I asked him if he was following Laura home, but he didn't even so much as look at me. All he did was sort of smirk a bit and then try to walk past me. In response, I walked with him, ready to sigh, telling him, you know, I don't think Laura wants you to be following her home, mate. You should stop. Again, he just ignores me, but... I can tell he's getting worked up, so I took a few steps away from him as I asked him once again if he thought following a girl home was maybe a bit of a bad idea. He didn't respond, not right away, and I was about to launch into another little plea to stop following us when, out of nowhere, he swung a punch at me and missed. I know it sounds a bit daft looking back on it, but I remember asking him, Whoa, 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 what's your bloody problem? His eyes went all wide, and he pointed a finger at me, then screamed, You! You're my sodding problem! I thought he was going to launch himself at me there and then, but he didn't. Instead, he turned his back, then walked off in the direction he'd come from. Bearing in mind that this was my first actual interaction with Linford. We'd never, ever spoken before, not even in primary school for any reason, but then the way he spoke to me... It was like we'd been arch-rivals for years or something. I suppose that looking back on it with hindsight, he resented me for being so close to Laura. So while I thought of him as nothing more than the lad who was a bit weird and sad, he'd been developing this full-on hatred for me for weeks on end. Thankfully, he stopped trying to follow Laura home after that, but instead, he turned his attentions to me. Linford gave me death stares whenever he and I crossed paths, and I'll be honest, it definitely had me a bit worried. He used to openly read this book about serial killers, which the teachers never did anything about because I suppose that technically, reading meant that he was educating himself and they probably didn't want to discourage it. But then that made me and everyone I hung around with think that Linford might actually pull some serial killer level crap and axe me to death in the corridors one day. I mean, we were sort of half-joking about it, but the other half was legitimately concerned. And when the Christmas holidays rolled around, I was only too happy to have a break from the daily death stares. But then, the day school ended, Linford tried following me home instead. I should have just tried to punch him, anything to stop him from following me, but 
I'm just not that type of person. I wasn't some hard case back then, and I'm not some hard case now either, so the idea of me trying to box this lad who was way taller and wider than me is just laughable. Luckily, Linford didn't seem to want to fight either, but at the same time, there was nothing I could do about him following me. He kept his distance, but obviously wanted me to know that he was following me because he wasn't exactly trying to hide it or anything. I tried losing him by walking in a circle around the local park, but no matter what I did, be it run across a field or suddenly change direction, he managed to get wind of where I'd gone and follow me. By the time I got to my house, I actually thought that I'd managed to lose him, but when I looked over my shoulder to check one last time before I walked through my front door, there he was. I felt sick, not because he outsmarted me or because he displayed a sort of Michael Myers level dedication to tracking my movements, but because I felt like I put my family at risk. I almost started to regret sticking up for Laura the way that I did. Because we knew her dad could handle the situation, he was a big scary looking builder, whereas my dad was much more like me, not a fighter by any stretch and definitely no match for a now 16 year old Linford. I remember keeping it to myself, which was unbelievably foolish in retrospect. Firstly, I thought that I'd end up on punishment for making trouble at school than bringing it home. Secondly, I knew that mentioning Linford to my parents would have a dark cloud hanging over us for the whole Christmas holidays. I was horribly anxious, but as the days went by and we got closer and closer to Christmas without incident, I started to think that Linford might just leave me alone. Turns out, I was right. Linford wasn't actually planning to do anything to me or my family, but the same couldn't be said for Laura. On Christmas Eve Eve, so the 23rd of December, I remember I stayed in bed much later than I usually would, then woke up to a load of missed calls on my phone, each of them from Laura. I called her back right away, assuming that it had to be some kind of emergency and my biggest fear was that it was something to do with Linford, and again, I just so happened to be right. She missed my first few calls, but called me back quite quickly, then basically said, I hope you're sitting comfortably because I got a story for you. You see, the previous night, everyone in Laura's house had been in bed when her dad was woken up by a noise coming from downstairs. Laura's house at the time was tall and skinny, so TV and dining rooms on the bottom floor, parents' room and bathroom on the first, then the two kids' rooms on the very top floor. Laura said that she didn't hear anything until much later, but her parents did, and when they woke up, they heard something coming from the backyard. Laura's dad looks out the back window and there's a person, dressed in all dark clothing, carrying a rucksack and he's trying to quite literally push their back patio doors in. Lauren's dad armed himself with a baseball bat that he kept under their bed, while her mum called the police and together... They watched this dark figure trying and failing over and over to push through their patio doors. I suppose it was an attempt to gain entry to the house as silently as possible, and having seen those patio doors myself, I know they open both outward and inward. My point is, there was a real possibility that if someone had neglected to lock the door up tight, the person might have been able to gain access to the house in almost complete silence. Anyway... Since it was a crime in progress, as they say, the police whizzed around pretty quickly, snuck around the back, then rugby tackled the would-be intruder. And at that, Laura's dad runs downstairs to give them a hand, but Laura said that all he kept saying was, let me get a look at him, let me get a look at him. Burglars are depressingly common around this time of year, with all the manner of expensive Christmas presents just sitting there under various trees, I think that was probably everyone's first thought, but then it must have hit Laura's dad before it hit her because it was only when he said, let me take a look at him, that she realized who it might have been, or rather, who it actually was. She said that she got chills the moment her dad said, yeah, that's him. He was here a few weeks ago after he followed my daughter home. It was Linford. Now the fact that he tried to break into her house in the middle of the night was frightening enough, but that was nothing on what Linford had in his backpack. The police found all sorts of pills, rope, knives, tools, a load of cheap headphones, and a cassette tape. 
The police told Laura's dad they tried playing the tape, but all that was on it was a weird kind of discordant music. Linford wouldn't explain what he was planning on doing. I know he was arrested, but he ended up getting charged with a load of different things, and I don't think I can remember them all off the top of my head. I know he got charged with attempted breaking and entering, but then there were other charges involving conspiracy to do all sorts of different things. I think kidnap was one, GBH was another, but then there was odds and sods in there too on account of all the crap that he had in his rucksack, something like conspiracy to administer poisons, something like that anyway. But regardless, Linford ended up doing a disappearing act for the second time, much to our relief, and if he managed to sit his exams, it definitely wasn't in our school. I sometimes wonder if he ended up going to kitty prison, and for how long, because if it were up to me, he'd be in some kind of loony bin to get some proper treatment. He was so obviously a wrongin' from the start that it just makes sense to think that there was either something wrong with him, or he came from some uber messed up household with God knows what kind of parents there to mess him up. Either way, if he got locked up, I hope he got some actual treatment for whatever was wrong with him, instead of just getting worse and worse until I end up seeing him on the front page of a newspaper over something truly terrible that he's done. The weirdest thing is though, I sometimes think that thing might involve me. He'd already shown up twice before in my life, why not a third? And if he's gotten worse and worse with age, what will he be like if I suddenly run into him in a dark alley one night? I suppose I might never know the answers to those questions. But what I do know is that if I ever run into Linford, I'll run a mile the other way just to avoid him. Being an addict during the holidays can be a surreal experience, and that's putting it lightly. My first Christmas as a junkie was actually pretty awesome if you can believe it. I was still a weekend warrior back then, limiting my doses to stave off physical addiction, and whenever I felt myself getting a little too into it, I'd wean myself off with Suboxone and then start all over again. But then as time went by, the small amount I used to do wasn't enough, so just a little got to be more and more. Slowly but surely, it took over my hobbies, work, then eventually family, until the only important thing in the world was making sure that I had enough not to get dope sick. I managed to stay functioning for about a year, and by that I mean I managed to hold down a job, keep up with relationships, and otherwise refrain from being a total screw-up. But after a bad breakup with the one girl that was holding me together... I gave up on any kind of dream or aspiration I had and settled on taking H for the rest of my life instead. I guess that sounds like a pretty crappy decision when I lay it out like that, but that's essentially what I did. I told myself it was all just temporary, that my so-called hero's journey would end in me kicking H after a few months on my butt, and that it would all end up being a crazy story that I told my drinking buddies one day. Well... A few months turned into six years of lost time, and like I said, the first few holiday seasons weren't so bad. But once I stopped talking to my parents and moved up to Portland, that's when things started getting rough. For a start, a junkie in the Pacific Northwest, the year is split into two halves. As the old Ella Fitzgerald song goes, summertime and the living is easy. And that's for all the obvious reasons you can imagine. Nice weather... Good dope after the dry season harvest down in Mexico, and everyone's relatively chilled out. But then in winter, all you got is dope from the wet season harvest, which is weak crap that barely gets you high, then on top of that, when it gets real icy or the snow is too thick, getting your hands on enough dope to see you through the day gets tougher and tougher. Then eventually around Christmas, Pretty much everyone who isn't a degenerate junkie takes a 24 to 48 hour break to sing Feliz Navidad, see their families and eat their turkey or whatever. An experienced junkie knows to stock up before then, meaning people are boosting and selling like crazy in anticipation of their dealers turning their cell phones off for the day. So in the run up to Christmas, I've been squirreling away cash like crazy and on the 23rd, me and my girl managed to score 15 grams of crappy dope that'd be enough to see us through this next week or so, 
without having to go out into the ice and snow to score more. We scored in the early afternoon, went back to my apartment, did enough to stop getting sick, then I went off to work for a few hours. My girl had a job working as a waitress and started her shift like an hour or two after I did, so it was normal that I'd come home to an empty apartment. So I finished my shift, one of the guys from work gives me a ride back home, and I got these tingles of exhilaration knowing I'm about to spend an hour or two in a warm bath with a few bumps of age to keep me company. I walk into my apartment, flop down onto the couch, then reach under it to pull out the little wooden box that we'd kept our dope in, and I sat it down on the coffee table, flipped it open, but instead of the five little baggies that should have been staring at me, there was nothing. At the time, I figured there had to be some kind of mistake. I had all these wishful thoughts, like maybe my girl had stashed the dope elsewhere after she saw the cops hanging around our apartment building or something, or maybe she poured all the dope into one of the bigger baggies that we had. You'd honestly be amazed at how much people will pay for baggies when they really, really need them, so maybe she'd sold or swapped the smaller ones, then just forgotten to put the dope back in the box. It sounds really pathetic looking back on it, but it took me a really depressing long amount of time to realize that there wasn't some innocent explanation for 300 bucks worth of dope going missing. My girl wasn't my girl anymore and on her way out, she'd stolen almost everything of value that she could carry. Again, sounds pretty pathetic, but I think that was one of the single worst moments of my life right there. My immediate reaction was, well, bad, but with addiction comes a certain pragmatism. Every moment I wasted freaking out that the love of my life had betrayed me for a few bags of dope was one that I wasn't spending trying to recoup my losses. So I got to work. I walked for miles, literally miles, making almost constant phone calls to a bunch of different people. Now don't get it twisted, I was still trying to call my girl, but she continued ducking my calls and in the end, it didn't make sense to jam up my line with calls to her voicemail, even if it did mean that I could leave her some threatening voicemails. I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. Anyway, I call around every dealer I know and everyone is either out of stuff or is finishing up for the night and not answering their phones. All out of options, I started calling around everyone I know that uses and all I can get my hands on is enough dope to last me the night. I walk over to the place, get the stuff, and walk all the way back to my apartment. I'm still trying to get a hookup the whole way. When I get back, I wait until I'm feeling gross, then I fix, go to bed, and wake up bright and early the next day to start all over again. The next day, pretty much the same thing happened, only without the goddamn disaster at the start of it. I walked all over town, almost constantly on the phone, but all I could find was enough to fix me for that night and that night alone. Everywhere I went, I was asking if anyone had seen my girl, and when everyone said no, every single time, I had this overwhelming sensation that they were lying to me. I guess it was partly paranoia but partly based in fact too because she couldn't have just disappeared on her own like that. Someone knew where she was and who she'd run off with. But even if they knew, they'd never tell me. No one wanted to have the blood on their hands and given the headspace that I was in at the time, I honestly couldn't tell you what I'd have done if I'd gotten my hands on my thieving ex-girlfriend. Anyway, like I said, I did a lot of walking and only managed to get a hold of about a half a gram so despite having enough to keep me from going into withdrawals on Christmas Eve, I knew Christmas Day was going to be rough as all hell. But still, the poetry of it wasn't lost on me. Cold turkey on Christmas Day, no better day for it, right? The weird thing, though, is when you're on heroin or any kind of powerful opiate, it kind of makes you chemically incapable of caring. Ever wonder why street junkies seem to have zero shame when it comes to begging or shoplifting? We just don't care. At least after those first few times, if you're deep enough into it, it becomes just another thing. So, I knew I was screwed, but it wasn't going to hit me until I started to get sick, and when it did, it hit me all at once. Around 8.30 on Christmas morning, I started calling everyone I knew who used again. This was the third day in a row, so people were only naturally starting to get sick of hearing from me. Everyone was either out or didn't have a single hit to spare me, and the more desperate I got, 
the more I turned to sketchier and sketchier sources. These were people who, for one reason or another, I'd learned not to associate or do business with, and in the case of one of them, I literally had him saved in my contacts as Sketchy Kevin. I worked my way through Sketchy Kevin, another guy I'd call Pissy Pete, and then finally a guy named Rat Tail, named so because he wore his hair in a rat tail like ten years ago after it got lame to do so. He also partly earned the nickname due to being a complete and utter scumbag, but by noon on Christmas Day, I was relying on that scumbag to score me some dope. Rat Tail said that he'd see what he could do, and would call me back if anything came up. About an hour later, he did, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear. Rat Tail said that there was a dude named George, who would just straight up give me a couple of grams, but he just needed a favor. Right away I thought that that was weird, because who the hell just gives away dope? But Rat Tail said that he wasn't a junkie, and he needed someone who didn't mind getting their hands dirty. I didn't like the sound of that, nor did I have any idea what Rat Tail meant, but I was also in no position to turn the offer down, so off I went after getting a hold of George's address. The last place I expected to end up that day was a nice-looking three-story right on the edge of where the city meets the suburbs. It was way too nice of a place to have any heroin inside, but then again, appearances can be deceptive. I walked up the driveway, knocked on the door, and some totally normal-looking, well-to-do dentist-looking dude welcomes me inside like I'm some late dinner guest that he'd been expecting. It was to the point where, despite this dude expecting me, I sort of didn't believe that he had the dope to just give away, and I started thinking that he was like a cop or something. I don't know how that had worked out, but I honestly couldn't mentally handle the setup, so I just started asking questions. Where's this dude's family? Did he actually have the dope? Could I see it, and could I fix before I did whatever he wanted me to do? The guy had no problem showing me the dope, and he had no problem if I used a little if it helped me get the job done. I was so desperate by then that whatever it was didn't matter. All that mattered was the dope. I took the baggie he gave me, went up to the bathroom and did my thing. All I did was smoke and snort, never got into needles, always hated them, so it was a relatively quick process of snorting some and then seeing what the deal was with the task that he wanted. And during that, George leads me onto the third floor of the house and into what he said was the guest bedroom. And there, lying on the bed, was the body. The kid looked to be about high school age, and he was just laying on their back, wide-eyed, with all this dried puke around his mouth. I'll never forget what George said to me when I gave him this look of horror. He was 18, I swear. The poor kid's age was the very last thing on my mind in that moment. I had a ton of other questions, and George seemed more than happy to fill me in without me asking. I, I don't know what happened. One minute we were... You know, then the next he... And that was all he said. Well, aside from the very last thing, which was, I need him gone. I'd rather not go into what happened next. I'm not proud of it, and to be perfectly honest, it's extremely incriminating. I don't imagine George was really George, and I don't know how in the hell he knew a guy like Rat Tail, but the only thing that keeps my conscience clean is thinking that at least he didn't kill him. If it was just a tragic accident that happened, I don't know, somehow, then all I did was help clean it up. At least that's what I told myself at the time. And now I'm not so capable of lying to myself that easily. I don't know if the poor kid was ever found, but if he was, it was never linked back to me. Maybe that George character, but never directly to me. And so, that's the story of the worst Christmas I ever had where I hid a dead body for some varnished old psycho just to get enough heroin to see me through the holidays. Worst thing is, I didn't even quit for like another year. Not truly, that is. But that was definitely the event that made me realize that I truly hit rock bottom. Getting clean was rough too, especially rough. I wanted so badly to put things right, but not only was I so high at the time that I'm not sure I could remember exactly where I put all the pieces, but I was far too cowardly to face up to all the terrible things I'd done during my years as a junkie. I guess this works as a sort of confession too, 
but I think it reads much better as a warning, and not even specifically regarding heroin either. No matter what you do in life, don't ever sell your soul for anything. And by that I mean nothing is worth selling your conscience or your innocence for, because they're not things that you can never get back once they're gone. And my second warning is that ghosts are very, very real. They're not real in the sense that you might expect, but if you do something terrible enough to someone innocent enough, you can bet your bottom dollar they'll haunt you for the rest of your life. Just like that poor naked teenager with puke around his mouth still haunts me. Every. Single. Christmas. During the early summer of 2006, I ended up getting a six-month prison sentence for credit card fraud. The ins and outs of it are sort of embarrassing, plus they aren't particularly interesting either. I was a greedy idiot who thought that he was smarter than everyone else, and then the Fed proved me wrong. Then, instead of trying to play it off like it was all just an innocent mistake, which at that stage would have risked getting me three to four years, I decided to take a plea deal. I had to sit down with two federal agents, explain exactly what I'd done and how I'd done it. Then after officially entering a plea of guilty, I got six months. My release date ended up being December 24th of 2006 and like every other prisoner with a short sentence, I was counting the days until my release. I had guys telling me not to do that, that I should just focus on keeping myself busy and that the days would take care of themselves. I was also housed with other non-violent prisoners, so although there was friction and the occasional fight between inmates, we didn't have to worry about all that stuff that goes on with the gangbangers and lifers that were housed in other tiers. I thought everyone around me was just a screw-up like I was, that there were no murderers, perverts, or other kind of psychopaths, but as I came to discover, that wasn't completely true. My cellmate was an okay dude, but we weren't close, so whenever we had any free time, I used to hang out with this group of three other guys. We'd just play cards and dominoes, chess or checkers, whatever we could get our hands on, and from time to time, we'd be joined by this guy that they called Spike. He looked to be in his late 30s, receding hairline, bright blue eyes, kind of a baby face considering how old he really was. He could have easily passed for a very stressed college senior, and he had the intelligence to match. When it came to chess and poker, Spike was the one he wanted to beat. I guess he'd had years to practice, but he was just on another level when it came to a thinking man's game. We'd all be talking crap to each other and Spike would just stay quiet, thinking things over until it came to making his move. I always assumed that he was in for some high level financial stuff, that he'd probably scan some hedge fund out of millions before he finally slipped up or something but I also never cared to ask him for what exactly he was in for. I can't speak for other prisons, or even other tiers of the one I did my time in, but generally speaking, you didn't ask what someone was in for when it came to non-violent crimes. If a guy was in for doing something to kids, they were generally kept sequestered from other prisoners, especially the violent ones. So on the whole, you just have an idea of what a guy is in for and you let sleeping dogs lie, as they say. But anyway, I do my six months and on release day, I'm going around saying goodbye to all the guys that I got in tight with and giving most of my stuff away. I get around most people and then it comes to saying goodbye to Spike. As usual, he didn't say all that much, but just like pretty much everyone else I talked to, they asked if I had plans for the holidays. I gave everyone the same reply and told him that I was planning on spending the holidays up at my parents, a place up in Vegas. I've been looking forward to it for months, and it seemed like the perfect antidote to spending six months inside. When they first got the news that I was headed to prison, they were a mix of furious and heartbroken. There was talk of cutting me off, and how I was quote-unquote killing my mother, but over time, their anger faded. All they wanted was for me to come home, and frankly, that's all I wanted too. I didn't share all of that with Spike, but... I think he got the gist of how I was feeling regarding my status as the all prodigal son. Most other guys had simply shaken my hand and said something to the effect of, have a good one, don't let me see you back here. But Spike actually took the time to give me some poetic advice. 
He told me to cherish every second I could with my nearest and dearest because God knows you miss them when they're gone. It was advice that I took right there on the spot to my heart, and as the CO walked me out of the tier later, I caught Spike's eye, and he reminded me of the advice that he'd given me. He didn't say what it was, not out loud, but we both knew. Now about a minute later, the CO leading me to the departures, that's literally what they're called, just like an airport, asked me, Do you know who that guy is? I told him, sure I did, that was Spike. But then the CO asked me if I knew who he really was. For the first time in the whole time that I was locked up, it actually occurred to me that, no, I didn't really know any of the guys that I'd shared a tear with. I mean, sure, I knew their day-to-day, I knew their individual personalities, but I didn't know all that much about their pasts or the specific details of the crimes they committed. I remember the distinct feeling of dread I felt as I asked him who Spike really was, and this is literally right as the CO is dropping me off at departures for processing. Mitchell Overhand, he told me. Go look him up. The first chance I got, I googled Mitchell Overhand and what I found had my jaw on the floor. You see, back in 1989, a 15-year-old Mitchell, or Spike as I'd come to know him, had a falling out with his mom and dad. I don't know what it was over, but from what I read, the relationship between them had been strained for quite some time. And then one day, Mitchell walks into the kitchen, or TV room, or whatever his mom and dad were sitting in, and shot them both at point-blank range. He took his dad out right away, maybe with a head or heart shot, I don't know for sure, but his mom was still alive. Then, either because he was out of bullets or because he felt like it, Mitchell took a claw hammer from his dad's toolkit, then bashed his mom's head in with it to finish her off. When he was done, he dragged their bodies into a shallow grave that he dug in a backyard flower bed, covered them over, and cleaned up the house, then threw a party for himself and his friends. To know the guy, you never would have guessed in a million years that he committed a crime like that. He was quiet, introspective, never did anything without thinking about it a whole bunch first. I guess that's what made him so good at poker, and I also guess it's a lesson that he learned the hard way. I also assumed that he'd moved in with the non-violent prisoners after it became obvious that he wasn't violent by nature. He must have done a few years in juvie before being transferred to an adult prison, and when he arrived they must have figured, hey, seems non-violent to us, let's house him appropriately. I never spoke to Spike again. I never talked to any of the guys I did time with actually, but as you can probably tell, I still think about them from time to time. More than time to time actually. I think Spike made a terrible mistake in a fit of rage and spent the rest of his years regretting it. I'm not saying he didn't deserve to be locked up for it. I mean, at the time I can understand why people would brand him as a monster then lock him up and throw away the key. But the man I met was not the same boy who killed his parents on a whim and it made the advice that he gave me about cherishing my time with them and how I'll miss them when they're gone, all the more haunting. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, keep your lunch nice and wet.